Well, good evening. I'm Irene Flint. I'm the head of the Green Sanctuary team at the Unitarian Church here. So we're into all sorts of sustainability projects. So this is right up our alley. And I'm also a member of the League of Women Voters, and we're also into green things. So this was a, a, a good example of a collaborative effort. And we're also happy that uh, Sustainable Wellesley I was uh, anxious to publicize this event, so here we are, all of us. So I'm going to introduce um, our president, Ann Rippy Turtle, and she's going to introduce our speaker. So here we go. Good evening. Uh, I think it's a wonderful turnout that we have on such a cold night. So thank you all for coming. Uh, the League is a nonpartisan political organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and, influ and influences public policy through education and advocacy. If you are not involved with the League and want to learn more, please speak to me or any other of our members who are here tonight. We have, I think we have some membership material. And through tonight's program, we will learn about current recycling challenges and new efforts at the Wellesley Recycling Disposal, Disposal Facility, or the RDF for short. We're delighted to welcome Jeff Azano Brown, superintendent of our RDF. Jeff joined Wellesley's Department of Public Works in 2001 and moved from a senior analyst and fleet manager position to become the superintendent of the RDF in 2016. The RDF uses the three R's solid waste management strategy, that is, reduce, reuse, and recycle, and processes all materials in an environmentally, operationally, and financially sound manner. The facility practices a source-separated model for recycling, which results in higher quality recyclable materials. The RDF returned approximately $798,000 to the town's general fund in fiscal year 2017 through the sale of recyclables, commercial trash fees, earth products, sales and fees, and commercial snow permits. One of the more recent and exciting initiatives at the RDF is a food waste drop-off program now open to all town residents after a successful pilot project. You can find a video of Jeff online reviewing how the program works and how to participate. It's quite good. It's short, and Wellesley Media actually, I think, recorded it. This recycling project received support from the Natural Resources Commission and the Sustainable Energy Committee, and it is estimated that food waste accounts for more than 25% of the waste stream in Massachusetts after recycling. Now, please join me in welcoming Jeff Azano Brown to talk about Massachusetts waste problem, recycling in crisis, and why we're focused on food waste. Jeff. Wow, I don't have anything left to say. That was pretty much everything. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, uh, Sustainable Wellesley. I hope let's get this right. The I think I have it written down, so I don't need to worry about that. Uh, the Green Sanctuary Ministry Team of UU Wellesley Hills for co-sponsoring this event and giving me the opportunity to talk to you all about everyone's favorite topic, municipal solid waste. <laughs> and you've all, I know this is high on everybody's list, uh, but really thank you for coming out on such a cold night uh, and weathering the storms, and I hope to make this worth your while. Uh, first off, I think I need to clarify what municipal solid waste is. Municipal solid waste is household trash, and that is leaves, grass, furniture, appliances, packaging, paint, batteries, basically anything that is generated through your home, we classify as municipal solid waste. And it's part of my goal as superintendent of the RDF to make sure that we, as Anna had already said, recycle as much of that product as is economically and environmentally sound. So we have a waste problem. Essentially, we generate more waste than we can process. 
And in Massachusetts specifically, we don't have the capacity to generate, uh, to process all of the waste that we actually generate. And I'll speak to that in a moment. But to give a little bit of a bigger picture, uh, the United States is the number one generator of waste in the world. We generate 30% of the world's waste and we only have 4% of the world's population. And so we essentially try to do a good job recycling and we do pretty well. We're ninth in the world. Uh, there's other countries that do much better. There's economic reasons for a lot of that. For instance, if you find yourself in Europe, there's less land that's available, so their landfill costs are higher. Also, in some, in some parts of Europe, there's actually fees on top of that. There's taxes on top of that. So similar to petroleum in Europe, regardless of the cost of the product, there's additional taxes that are placed on top of that that create environmental incentives, economic incentives, to actually have alternatives. And the same thing is there for landfills in Europe, where there's a tax on top of it, so that creates additional incentives to have waste to energy facilities and also increased recycling. One thing that's, that's important to emphasize is that recycling and waste is a commodity. It's traded globally. It's a local problem, that, and that's how we generate recycling and trash. But it's a global problem because we pass it on to essentially the highest bidder or wherever the cost is lowest. This map actually represents e-waste uh, trading. So e-waste is electronic waste. It's your computers, it's your televisions, and other electronics. And those are not necessarily processed in the United States. So you might have your computer that you're recycling at the recycling disposal facility, and that's going to end up, say, in China. It might end up in Vermont. It might end up in Indonesia, where it's been broken down into its components and, and done the best job recycling as possible. And there's certifications that we make sure that our handlers have so that they're what's called certified to make sure that they're actually processing it in the most environmentally sound practices. But what this is meant to just illustrate is the fact that waste is a global commodity. And some argue, of course, that it disproportionately affects poor communities. Others might argue that it gives those poor communities an opportunity to participate in the global economy. But regardless, this is where we are right now. We are operating in a global economy when it comes to waste. So I mentioned that Massachusetts has a waste problem. And Massachusetts waste problem isn't strictly economic. It's not simply because landfill costs are lower in our neighboring states. It's because we have a capacity problem. There's essentially a limited number of landfills in Massachusetts and a limited number of waste to energy facilities, incinerators. There's two ways of dealing with trash. One is to burn it and then bury the ash. And the other is to just bury it. So aside from reduce, reuse, recycle, those are the options that are available to us. What this chart is representing is the De Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection's projections for trash disposal from 2018 to 2025. If you focus on 2018, you'll see that essentially Massachusetts generates about 5.6 million tons of trash per year. The average WTE, waste to energy capacity, is staying the same throughout these projections because we're not opening any new waste energy facilities. None are being permitted. The landfill capacity, you can see that that's really the dynamic that's changing. We have a certain number of landfills in Massachusetts. There's no new landfills that are being permitted, not because DEP won't permit them, but there's no landfills that are actually going for additional permits. And that <coughs> landfill capacity is filling up. We keep on generating trash. It needs to find a home. And so as we fill up those landfills, we need to export more waste. So back in 2018, you can see the projection at this point was 780,000 tons of trash in red. In 2021, we're going to have two more landfills that close. And in 2025, an additional two landfills will close. I believe that leaves us with two left. So in 2018, it's forecast that we're going to export about 800,000 tons of trash. And in 2025, we're going to be exporting close to 2.2 million tons of trash. Now, in 2018, that's approximately 14% of our tonnage. But in 2025, that's almost 40% of the tonnage that we're generating in Massachusetts. To try to put those figures in perspective, 
like to use uh, Fenway Park as a measure. So in 2018, we're essentially filling up 10 Fenway Parks a year and shipping it out of state. And by 2025, it's gonna be close to 30 Fenway Parks. So if you've been to Fenway Park and you've seen the expanse and the bowl that we're filling up each year, again, we're projected to do 30 of those per year by 2025. So one of the questions you may ask yourself is, where's it going? Well, essentially, it's going to landfill and it's going out of state. And where it's going is further north, further west, and further south. And what we've started to see, is, you'll see Ohio on this map. Now, Ohio, we've got some low cost for land, and we're also starting to see interest in Pennsylvania, Virginia for taking waste. And Massachusetts isn't alone here. We've got other states that are shipping it further, whether it's by truck or by rail. And the real impact of that is that it's just gonna get more expensive. And so these, there's what's called landfill tipping fees. Landfill tipping fees are the cost to dispose of the item once it arrives there. It doesn't cover transportation at all. It's just once you get to the gate, what are you gonna charge, when are you gonna get charged to actually tip it there? And so there's three lines here, if you can make them out. The very top in blue is the Northeast. That's where we are, That's the landfills around us. And you'll see that they're higher everywhere else because, higher than everywhere else because our, the cost of land in the Northeast is higher than in the Midwest and in the South. And what you see here is just a moderate increase. And it's not too bad, it's roughly three to 5% per year Nothing astronomical, but it is steadily increasing and we don't anticipate it, that it's gonna go down. The other thing that we do anticipate though is that once landfills start closing, you have a, a supply and demand issue, we're gonna to start to see this rise. Our current trash contracts are increasing at a rate of about 3% a year and we're worried that those are gonna to start to increase even more. So what can we do? Well, well, we could choose to do nothing and simply pay more in taxes. But at increasing at a rate of 3% a year, some of you are probably familiar with Proposition 2.5, which any increases over 2.5%, we need to get past town meeting, voted past town meeting. Um, so it's already putting internal pressure on our budgets uh, to provide less services or cheaper services. That can be a good thing, a little, a little healthy pressure is good. Um, but in general, it's putting trash in competition with our other programs, whether it's our schools, our recycling efforts, our police departments, our fire departments, and so that's not helpful. Um, the other thing we could do is we, we could wait for government to step in and have some regulations that dramatically affect packaging products and industry, consumer habits, um, and there's some great examples of that, and let me give you one. Um, in Norway, and Norway has a fantastic, essentially a bottle bill, and where I think everybody here is probably familiar with the bottle bill, uh, they have a, essentially an increased fee by about 15 cents, which goes along each packaged, um, excuse me, plastic bottle. And, but the thing that's a little bit different about Norway's model is that the producers of those bottles are responsible for them. And if they cannot capture, as a collective, all the bottle producers, 95% of those products, they have to pay a fee. They have to pay a tax on top of it. And that's created an incentive for those manufacturers to create enough of an infrastructure to capture that. So there's vending machines, there's stores, there's gas stations where anyone can bring those bottles and get that fund, that 15 cents essentially, that redemption. And that's created that infrastructure. And they've actually, I mentioned that there's a 95% capture rate that they need to achieve in order not to pay the taxes. And for the last seven years, they haven't had to pay that tax. So it's been a very successful program. Um, but in reality, all those type of changes would take a lot of time if they could even happen. We tried to have an extended bottle bill uh, passed in Massachusetts a few years ago, and it failed. People are not interested in uh, paying additionally if they don't have to, although they're fine with liquor and beer being sold anywhere. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can continue the mantra and continue our habits of reduce, and reuse, recycle, and that's part of where we put our efforts. So, of course, I'm probably speaking to the choir here, preaching to the choir, almost literally. Um, uh, reduce, so simplify your life, you know, use less, do you really need it? Fix it, if you can fix it, 
extend the life, let's, let's purchase less, um, reuse, donate, uh, donate to thrift stores, buy at thrift stores. <laughs> we, I mean, we, a lot of us do a great job you know, donating, but uh, I don't know how many of us actually go and shop at thrift stores, but that's a great way of actually Rummage. reducing our impact. Rummage sales. Rummage sales, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the RDF reusable area, pick up stuff there. Um, and of course, use reusable bags, reusable mugs. Those do have an impact. They really do. Um, and of course, recycle. And that's where the RDF really comes in, of course. Uh, we've got excellent access to recycling in Massachusetts. Not every state does. Um, and we've got an excellent resource in the RDF. I'm plugging that, of course, um, in Wellesley. So please make great use of it. It is a fantastic resource. Uh, but some of you, of course, have probably heard about some of the recycling difficulties in the, in the past couple of years. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But before I talk about where we are today, I think it makes a little bit of sense to put sort of recycling in context uh, since the, the post-World War II area. So in World War II, uh, some of you might even be intimately familiar with, there was a major effort, obviously, to collect scrap material for the war effort. Um, we've got metals and paper that were in really short supply because metals and lumber were needed to make tanks, ammunition, machine guns, um, and so they were in short supply here, so we needed to capture as much as possible. Rubber and tin were also in short supply because when Japan invaded Southeast Asia, the, one of the first things that they did is cut off the supply of rubber and tin. So those were in short supply here. So there were major drives sponsored by the federal government to collect that scrap. And so what they call scrap drives then, we call recycling today. And it started to become a part of everyday Americans and a sense of pride and purpose obviously also came out of that because we were working towards the greater good and it was needed economically and it was needed for the good of the country. And so we know sort of what happened after that is that we've got victory and, and the, we won the war. And then shortly after that, we had baby boomers and an increase in population. And also shortly after that, we had the throwaway society. So the throwaway culture of the 50s was not a very good time for recycling. Uh, the economy was booming. Um, essentially, people became more affluent new was better. And unfortunately, that phenomenal growth really put a de-emphasis on recycling because it wasn't needed for any economic reason. Also, then we get to, also in the 50s, the first landfill in the United States was created. And it was created in Staten Island. And it was called the Fresh Kills Landfill. And I love that name. I think it's so apropos. Uh, and that eventually became the largest landfill in the world. The first one is the largest. I'm trying to move forward through time, we start to see a resurgence of environmentalism as a, come out, as a, a res result of that throwaway culture. We move to the 70s, and in the 70s, the recycling really started to gain steam again. Uh, the environmentalism of the 60s morphing into the 70s, we saw the first Earth Day, we saw the birth of the recycling symbol, uh, we saw the first bottle bill, we saw the first recycling mill, we saw the first curbside collection of recycling, uh, and in 1976 the Federal Resource Conservation and Recovery Act was created to basically close down open dumps, put restrictions on landfills and health re requirements on landfills as well as incinerators, and really create standards that propel us forward today. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Martha Stone when I talk about the 70s and recycling. Some of you may be familiar with Martha Stone. She was instrumental in starting recycling in Wellesley. She started first with a group of high school students and recycling glass. And she took, had everybody dump glass at the RDF, picked it up, and brought it up to the Coca-Cola mill, uh, up, up on 128, I believe. And that was back in February 11th, 1971, when she started that. So we're coming up on 50 years of recycling in Wellesley, and that's something that you should all be proud of. Um, really a pioneer here. And what she, as well as other volunteers and activists have done throughout the years, is just 
provide the impetus to push us forward and make, help us do a better job. Um, what you'll see on the right side of this photo is uh, the incinerator back when it was created. And some of you may or may not be familiar with the incinerator. Essentially, this is how we took care of trash in Wellesley for a number of years, where the garage bays that you see there, we dumped trash in there. There were some cranes on the inside that would pick it up and just put it into an incinerator, burn it, and then it would bury it at the RDF. And that only happened for a few years, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and then we have actually sort of a, a similar crisis where you'd have the, the Clean Air Act and restrictions on wetlands, so our 88 acre facility that's the RDF, we've got about 60 of that that's actually wetlands that we can't touch. And thank goodness, because we would have buried all of that with ash. Uh, so now that created some difficulties on DPW's side, which we've adapted to, but part of the solution to that, Martha Stone de deserves a lot of the credit for, and the, the group at the time, Action for Ecology, and all the volunteers there for pushing the DPW forward and the town forward to actually start recycling programs. So moving forward to the 80s and 90s, essentially curb is king. Curbside programs just exploded. Um, also during the 80s and 90s, we saw the environmentalism start to pick up again. In 89, we had the 20th anniversary of Woodstock, and I remember in 93, uh, Earth Day, and the Clinton administration, it was, recycling was still going strong. Uh, from 1988 to 1992, uh, curbside programs increased from 1,000 in 88 to almost 4,400, 5,400, excuse me, in 1992. Also in the mid-90s, California started to take hold with single stream recycling. Not coincidentally at that same time is when China started to import recycling from around the world. Eventually, China would get up, would start importing 30 to 40 percent of United States recycling. 30 to 40 percent. And so we became incredibly dependent upon China as a nation. So over the next 25 years, China continues to take our recycling. And they're taking low quality recycling, they're taking hazardous material, uh, they're, and they're relying on their citizens to pick through this material to find the valuable product that can actually be recycled. Some of the product is good, some of the product is not so good. A lot of the product is hazardous. They would frequently melt electronics in order to salvage the metals. In order, they'd burn wires in order to salvage the little bit of copper that's in there. And at that same time, they're essentially polluting their environment. And they're doing this for such a long time and with such devastating impacts that eventually there's enough of an outcry from the population and some expose videos that get made and put pressure on the prime president, excuse me, and he finally feels enough pressure that he's got to do something. And I think that it was a combination of environmental pressure and the potential for civil unrest that actually led to the decisions that they made. And those decisions that they finally made took form in essentially import restrictions. And there's two phases of those so far. Now, the first was called Green Fence, and this is back in 2013. And Green Fence essentially was an intensive inspection of cargo ships coming in and offloading materials. And what they were looking for is poor quality recycling and try to actually bring in material that was worth it economically and that wouldn't ca cause them embarrassment, essentially, coming in. Eventually, they eased those restrictions and then in 2017, enacted a new round of restrictions called National Sword. And National Sword was really targeting scrap at this point and also other items, I hate to call them items, uh, other imports like human smuggling, uh, drug smuggling. So all of those type of imports they were really trying to crack down on, but where we faced it on our end was really with recycling. And so they were looking for low quality plastic and also paper with high moisture content, because moisture is really bad for paper, which is why at the RDF we have it in a covered area. So those, went, those restrictions for National Sword have gone through a couple different iterations. So they've banned entire categories of recycling and said, we're not taking anything. 
Then they ease those restrictions and they replace them with minimum contamination standards that were essentially impossible for most of American recycling to meet. In context, a typical single stream material recovery facility, MRF is an acronym for it, MRF, is designed and built to have about a 2% contamination rate come out of the quality of recycling that they are producing. And what China had imposed was first a 0.5% contamination rate and then a 0.3% contamination rate. So the economics that have already been built in to all the town's contractual agreements with material recovery facilities at X number of dollars per ton, all of a sudden were under a lot of pressure because the facilities could not make those requirements. They'd have to slow, essentially slow down the conveyor belts, hire more workers, and their costs would increase likely. So they were facing a lot of economic pressure at that point, which then, what do they do? They're gonna pass that on to the towns. And so what had happened, but again, some of the towns are in contractual agreements, and so the towns are saying, our, our contract is our contract. And the processors are saying, well, we're gonna go bankrupt if we continue this way. And so what do they do? A stockpile. So they hold on to product with, the, with the hopes that maybe China will ease the restrictions. But nobody knows, so they continue to stockpile, and they continue to stockpile, and continue to stockpile. And eventually, uh, the levy breaks, and they've got to do something with it. And so what do they do? Well, if there's no law against it, well, they start to throw it away, and they landfill it. If there are laws against it, like what we have in Massachusetts, we have what are called waste bans. And waste bans are essentially restrictions on throwing away certain types of materials. Well, then you get a waiver and say, please let us throw this away, and they're able to, to skirt some of the process somehow. But bottom line, it's creating an economic unrest uh, within the industry. And so here are some essentially pictures of land-filled uh, recycling, unfortunately. So what this does to the recycling industry is not only cause the cost of processing this material to skyrocket, but it also creates an overabundance of material on the other markets. Again, China is taking 30 to 40 percent of this material. Now it's available to other buyers who say, well, I don't need to pay that much for it because you have so much of it. So it causes the value of recycling to plummet, creating further pressure on towns. So everybody happy now? I mean, that's great news, right? Um, this is a Chinese character for crisis. And it's made up of, of two symbols when written Chinese. And one is danger, and the other is opportunity. And I think what we really have now is an opportunity to take a good, cold, hard look at ourselves and our practices and say, what can we do? And what do we need to do? I mean, bottom line, this is our problem. This is our waste. This isn't China's waste. It's not China's problem. This is our problem. We're producing this material. So again, what can we do? So a lot of towns, governments, states are taking a look at cleaning up recycling. That's really, that is a part of it. We still produce a lot. It's not the first thing we should do. We should start with reduce. We should start with reuse. But once we get down to recycling, we need to have clean recycling. Just because we call something recyclable doesn't mean that it's going to get recycled. Doesn't mean that it's clean enough to get recycled. Doesn't mean that there's the infrastructure to actually recycle it. So this is Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection's Recycle Smart campaign. This is really designed for single stream facilities, but it's got great elements of a simplified recycling campaign. It's got pictures of what they want got simple descriptions, and really what's important here is also what they don't want. They don't want plastic bags in the single stream bin. They don't want what they call tanglers, you know, garden hoses, Christmas lights. I know we like to think that, you know, this projector right here is made out of plastic, so it must be recyclable. Let me put it in the recycling bin. But what happens is that that just gums up the works. Those single stream facilities are designed for the everyday household project products. They're not designed for your muffler. They're not designed for a bowling ball. They're designed for a plastic bottle, your newspaper, your cardboard, your glass bottle. And they don't really even like the glass. That actually is not very good for their systems. 
So again, it's a great, great program. If you're participating in a single stream program, I encourage you to go to their website. There's a great recyclopedia where you just type in an item, it'll tell you what to do with it. And it's great for that program. And I think one of the things that's really important here to identify is know your program in your town. Because every town has a different program. They all have slight differences because they're bringing it to different locations. And the RDF is actually a really good example of that. Here's the RDF recycling guide. It's a little bit more complex. There's a lot more items. There's a lot more sorting. This is because we have the antithesis of the single stream model. We have what's called a source separated model, which means that we separate everything out. So we have, instead of one bin for everything, we have six bins for paper. We have four bins for plastics. We have three bins for glass. We have a very high level of sorting. And we're also very supportive of this model. We think that it's a superior model because that it delivers a more economic value for the town. We think that it has a higher environmental value as well. One of the problems of the single stream facilities is that you're essentially mixing everything together and then hoping that you can separate it all out with the same level of cleanliness. And you can't. Uh, so the source separated model allows us to have an extremely clean product, which has n more economic value. And the reason is because it has more recyclable value. As soon as you dirty a product, it becomes less recyclable, becomes less valuable. So we're strong proponents of the source separated model. Not every town has the resources of a recycling and disposal facility. There are plenty of other towns that, that do, but we've had such a shift in culture to a single stream curbside model that it would take a, a fair amount of effort, I think, and, and change of culture for us to move back. Um, so I encourage any town that continues to have a transfer station to hold on to it. And maybe I should just specify what a transfer station is. A uh, transfer station, it, like the RDF, is a place where things come in and everything goes out. It's, it's just transfer, as opposed to a dump where things come and they stay and sit forever. So although we're affectionately known as the dump, <laughs> We are a transfer station. So what else can we do? And this is where we start to shift the conversation. Sorry, sir. Does that mean that the multi-stream is safely recycled to China and so forth? Because it's not contaminated? In Wellesley's system. Yeah. The, the probability that the material will get recycled is much higher. Okay. So for instance, uh, to get into the nitty gritty a little bit, as I was saying before, recycling is a commodity and there's standards for those commodities. And there's an institution called ISRI, which is essentially the Institute for Scrap Recycling Industries, which defines certain grades of recyclable product. As an example, clean cardboard that is uncontaminated with any other product is what's called number 12 double sorted cardboard. That has a value on the market because of its high quality. If it's a little bit contaminated, now it's a number 11 cardboard, and it has a lesser value. Or you could go down to what's just mixed paper altogether, which is now a grade 52, which is just mixed residential paper. And that's exactly the type of product that's produced through a single stream facility and that China has stopped buying because of its low quality. There are some mills that can recycle that. There's just not very many of them. So after we've cleaned up our recycling and done our best and not wish cycled and thrown what we hope is recyclable into, into our recycling bin, we at the RDF start to focus on what is next. And so in order to help guide that decision-making process, we start to look at what's in our trash. And this is what's called a waste characterization study. And a waste characterization study is just looking at what's in your trash. And if you take a look, you can see that paper makes up a large portion of it, plastics, cardboard, I'm sorry, not cardboard, C and D, um, electronics, metal, hazardous waste. And we have active programs for all of these already at the RDF. And then we start to look at organics. And in addition to the leaves, grass, and brush that we take at the RDF, the rest of that category of organics is essentially food waste. So food waste makes up in between 20 and 30% 20, uh, 20 of municipal solid waste. And so we decided that it would be a good idea to take a good hard look at food waste 
Of course, we encourage backyard composting. That's a fantastic way of dealing with your food waste. You don't have to drive it to the RDF in order to get rid of it. Um, but we wanted to take a look at food waste uh, in general and see if that was something that we can incorporate into our program. And in preparation for doing that, as a precursor, we decided to look at food waste a little bit more broadly on a town-wide basis and say, well, what can we do uh, throughout the entire town to reduce our food waste? And food waste, what I mean food waste is food scraps. It's what you're producing when you're making your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's the expired food that you have in your refrigerator. It's the, the meal that you thought you were going to eat that went a little bit too long, and now you've got to figure out what to do with it. And so you can compost it in your backyard, but there's other solutions too. So we want to take a step back and take a look at town-wide what we could do. So what, what we did at the DPW is that we got together with our 3R working group. And our 3R working group is a group of town entities. It's the Sustainable Energy Committee, it's the Natural Resources Commission, and it's the DPW. And we formed this group to work together to try to tackle a number of initiatives in town. And so we got together and started talking about food waste. And this is the Environmental Protection Agency's food recovery hierarchy. And not surprisingly, it has a lot of similarities with the reduce, reuse, recycle mantra and priorities. So we start at the top with source reduction, right? Buy what you need, eat what you need, nothing more. That's, uh, when we get to the next phase, it's feed hungry people. And so we did some research and we found an organization in Cambridge called Food for Free. And what Food for Free does, let me back up a second. Food recovery is not something new. Everyone has probably heard about programs that donate food to food pantries, whether it's a supermarket or a bakery, and that's been going on for decades. What hasn't been going on for decades is the food that's been presented. So you might have your hot bar at the supermarket that they don't sell everything at the end of the day. And the same thing happens in colleges and institutions. They don't sell everything. And so Food for Free uh, took a look at this and working along with the uh, uh, Harvard Law Food Policy, help me, <laughs> uh, and health departments establish guidelines for how to collect that food in a, in a safe manner following food policy guidelines and actually distribute it. So what they do is that they collect that material, it gets stored in freezers according to food safety guidelines, and it gets brought back to their facility and they repackage it and then they distribute it to the food insecure. And they're doing this all around Boston and we thought what a fantastic thing and how do we expand it into the Metro West? So we started some outreach. We reached out to the area colleges. And part of the reason why there's a little bit of an infrastructure um, that helps facilitate this is I had mentioned the waistbands before for items like leaves, appliances, cardboard, those laws that don't allow us to throw away those materials. And in 2014, Massachusetts had installed, had enacted a, a food waistband, essentially for commercial generators of one ton a week or more they're not allowed to throw it away anymore. They have to do something else with it. They either have to compost it or send it to an anaerobic digester. So it started to create an incentive for industry to step in. And so it starts off with those institutions needing to collect it and understand their waste. And so they start to look at their waste and, well, how much are we generating? And we don't want to be subject to a ban, so how do we cut that down? And then it starts to also, now that they have an understanding of their waste, what do they do with it? And so Food for Free, in working with these institutions, found a way to get them to essentially band together and get enough density to collect all that material and repackage it into, into sustainable meals, into nutrient meals, and distribute it to the food insecure around Boston. And so again, then we started to say, well, what can we do in the Metro West? So we got together with the schools in the area. We got together with Wellesley College, with Olin, with Babson, uh, with, with Bentley, with Brandeis, and Wellesley Middle School. And we started to have conversations. We started with the sustainability directors in those uh, communities. And then we go to the food service providers, and then the health agents, and finally got everyone to work together and to understand all the complexities and provide enough impetus to actually get it started. And that project, that program's been in for almost a year now, if, if not more, where the food is actually being collected by Food for Free, packaged into meals, and then 
actually redistributed not only to areas in Boston, food insecure in Boston, but even to Mass Bay Community College. So we're taking the waste that's being generated here and actually redistributing it here. And it's actually a fantastic story, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, none of which has to do with the RDF, but it's just a great story. Uh, something fantastic that's being done. So at the same time, we wanted to see, well, what's the role for the RDF at this point? So we deal with people's waste after they've reduced and reused for the most part. Uh, so what about the recycling portion of it? We've been promoting backyard composting, but is there something more we can do? Because not everybody in Wellesley is composting in their backyard. So we started to look sort of in the middle to bottom of this area, industrial uses and composting. Uh, I think you're familiar with composting, where basically your vegetable scraps, your, fruit, um, your vegetable, your fruit, your grain, it, you can put that in your backyard and start to compost that. But there's things that it doesn't cover. There's things that aren't part of that backyard composting program, like meats, dairies, bones. And that's where the industrial uses come in. And so it's a little bit higher on the hierarchy. And we started to look at the infrastructure around Boston to see, is it robust enough that we think that we can actually uh, participate in that. And because of that uh, Massachusetts waste ban on commercial food, there started to be enough infrastructure that that became feasible. There was haulers that were taking that material away from Roach Brothers, Whole Foods, Shaw's, all the supermarkets in the area. And there was also then the processors of that material, whether it be a farm or what's called an anaerobic digester. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail uh, a little bit later. But we decided to go with the anaerobic digester model for two reasons. One, because it could simply take more product. It could take that meat, it could take those bones, it could take uh, shells. So your, you know, your holiday turkey that you're, you're done with, you can just come in, throw that into the, the bin and we'll, we're able to take it. And we also thought that it would be the portion of population in Wellesley that would be willing to separate out their food waste and bring it in their car to the RDF and dump it into a yucky container might also have a backyard program. And we thought that we'd be a good match for supplementing that type of program where if they wanted to continue to do backyard composting with vegetable and fruit, and fruit scraps, but then bring the rest of the materials to the RDF, we would be a good complement there. So that's why we chose the anaerobic digester model. So in doing that, we decided to have a pilot program. And so we opened up the pilot program to 600 households. Uh, we distributed starter kits to those 600 households, which are basically a countertop bucket, compostable bags to line that bucket, and then a larger container with a nice sealed lid so that you can actually transport your food waste safely to the RDF. And hopefully if anyone's had those tip over, they're still uh, not leaking food waste onto their cars. Uh, and the purpose of the pilot was to understand the costs associated with it, see who would actually participate in the program, how much material we would generate, and what truly were the costs, as well as what problems arose from it, and how do we deal with those. Uh, so we did that pilot for a year, and we recently deemed it a success, which I, I'd like to think that it is, and, and so now we're opening it up to the rest of the population, and that's part of why I'm here, is to promote that and to encourage you all to sign up. And you don't need to sign up, you just need to start participating. And it's really simple, you just put your food waste into compostable bags and put it in the container. It's pretty easy. So the results of that pilot program were that we diverted 62 tons over that year from the landfill and brought that to the anaerobic digester. That anaerobic digester produced 18,000 kilowatts for that year of energy. It sounds like a lot. Could be a lot. It takes about uh, 12,000 12, kilowatts a year to offset the energy of one home. So it's not like it's a country's worth of energy, uh, it, but it's certainly something higher and better that you can be doing with your waste. Otherwise, it's just going to a landfill. It's producing methane, which is being released as a greenhouse gas. So nothing great on the other end. Uh, you might be curious as to what is going on. And how is, what is this process after I magically just dump it off and it just disappears? Uh, so what this graphic is, is an, a description of that. At the top, it's very hard to read, but it's, it's called source separated organics. So again, we're a source separated facility. The organics is the food waste component of that. So you drop it off at the RDF, at the very top. 
We deliver it to a facility, which is owned by waste management right now. That's just one avenue that we take advantage of right now, but there are others. And essentially, they put it into a big blender. And they create a homogenized mix, a smoothie, instead of the components of your individual, <laughs> your banana and your, and your milk and everything. They create a nice homogenized mix. And they put those into tanker trucks. That's the third portion of that. And eventually, it goes to what's called an anaerobic digester. And an anaerobic digester basically breaks down waste the same way your stomach does in an environment without oxygen, anaerobic. And the byproduct of that is methane. And that methane gets captured. And there's two things that happen with that. It gets burned, and that turns into electricity. And then they use that electricity to dry out the rest of the product, and it becomes a low-level fertilizer. So those are the, the bifurcation at the bottom there. And they can either sell the electricity to the grid, and they can also have the byproduct of the fertilizer. So with that, we thought that was pretty cool. With the waste that we're generating in Wellesley, we're creating locally generated sustainable energy. We like that. All from food scraps. And I can't talk about this without talking about <laughs> Back to the Future and the DeLorean and, and Doc. So. Now, I know we've got a lot of sorts at the RDF. I know the residents spend 10 to 15 minutes on the recycling wall separating everything out. And again, we think that it's not only economically but environmentally the best thing that we can do with our waste. Um, and we do really strongly believe that it's best for the town. We know it's not easy, but it produces superior results. And I like this graphic because if, I, if we didn't sort our silverware, or if we didn't sort our clothes, yes, it'd be easier. I wouldn't have to you know, instruct my kids on how to do it and have them fold everything and put it in the right place. But if they didn't do that, it would certainly be hard to find that second sock. So sometimes easier isn't better. So how do you participate? Again, it's really easy. And so we're encouraging all residents to, to participate. It's a really easy program. Compostable bags are available online from local retailers. And you just have to put the food waste in a compostable bag and drop it off in the bins at the facility. It's that simple. I think you'll be surprised if you talk to other people who participate in the program on how good it feels to do something better with your food waste. I've talked to lots of people who wouldn't self-identify as greenies who, who just say it just feels better and that's been a fantastic response but also I think you'll be surprised also how it affects your regular household trash and that you feel you don't have to empty that as frequently um, so if you've got questions about it in particular we'll give some time to answer those here but feel free to give us a call at the RDF we're happy to answer any of your questions and walk you through how to get started and how to participate and so with that, I will end the presentation and just give an opportunity. And one of the things I just want to say again is that, uh, again, in crisis, there is opportunity. And this is our opportunity to do something better with our waste, to change our habits. Of course, I encourage you to start with reduction and start with reuse. But once we get down to recycling, please recycle your food waste, participate in the program, do backyard composting. We can make a difference. It's a substantial portion of our waste. So I encourage you to participate. So thank you. I'm happy to open the room up to questions at this point. So the question is, does the electricity that we're generating offset the, the cost and the environmental cost of actually bringing it to these facilities? That's a great question. Um, one thing to think about is that we're driving it to a facility anyways. We're driving it to a landfill. So instead of driving it to a landfill and having it sit there and produce methane that leaks into the environment, we're driving it to a facility that's capturing that methane and turning it into electricity. 
So, and could I tell you if the value of that offsets the value of actually getting it there? I would venture to guess it does not. But it's offsetting in general, just not to the degree of all transportation. Can you educate us about the garbage disposal? I, my house, I imagine, a lot of food waste on the drain. Tell us what happens to that. Sure, the question is related to food waste and garbage disposals, and what happens to that. Well, food waste in a garbage disposal goes into the sewer system, and for, areas in, uh, for residents in the Boston area, that goes to Deer Island. So it gets processed as sewage sludge. It, one thing, we do not want to encourage garbage disposals in general because it puts tolls on the sewage system. In Wellesley, we have sewer pipes that are 100 years old, and so we don't want to put any more stress and strain on them. There's actually an interesting dynamic that is going on with garbage disposals, I'm sorry, with the sewer system. Ah, I'm talking about the sewer system. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's been phenomenal over the years is that we have low flow toilets, shower heads, um, washing machines, and which has reduced the amount of water that's actually going through the sewer system. Unfortunately, the sewer system and how it's designed relies on water to push sewage through it. And so we don't want to put more solid matter down the garbage disposal because that actually hurts the sewer system. It makes it harder for it to, to function well and unfortunately causes backages, which no one wants to deal with those blocks. Yes? What kind of thought has been given to having restaurants participate in this program? So the question is related to restaurant participation in the program, which I'll actually sort of get a little bit higher of you and say commercial businesses in general. And so commercial businesses, it could be, and we classify anything that is a commercial business is, that is not the resident's responsibility. So the RDF is paid for by the taxpayers of Wellesley. And our principal function is to deal with residential material. That's why we're here. And we use our facility and take commercial material in order to lower the cost for residents. So we've thought about and had preliminary discussions with dealing with commercial entities, some of the, some of the smaller schools in town, even Wellesley College, on taking on their material and participating in the program. But what we can't do is take that for free. We would have to charge them for that function. And so we've had some preliminary discussions in that respect, but right now we're just confining it to residential participation until we're sure that we could service them adequately. But that's definitely something that we're looking into because for the private companies right now, there's not enough root density that they've created out here in order to justify servicing them. So we think that we could play a role in the meantime by educating those institutions and the restaurants, creating that root density, and maybe we wouldn't be in it long term, but at least we would get it started and and have it be a successful program going forward. So that is something that we're looking into. Yes? Would you comment on the other the material that comes into our RDF from other towns and other places? Because I understand if you do, you provide a service to other uh, communities that maybe don't have the same ability to handle all this stuff. That's right, yeah. The, the question is related to other towns and other entities that use the RDF as a facility and, and how do we deal with them. And so there are a number of entities that we deal with, um, not just residents at the RDF. So we take recycling from the town of Dover. Uh, we take recycling from Wellesley College. We take recycling from Dunkin' Donuts, Captain Martin's, the Linden store. And what we do is essentially, if the recycling has value, we're willing to take that for free. If there's items that have costs associated with them, then we charge for those materials. So as an example, we used to take single stream recycling from certain entities in town and out of town, but because it was a cost item for us, we would pass that cost on to them, but we would just act as a transfer station, which is what we are. We leverage our infrastructure and make a little bit of money to offset the overall cost of the operation for the taxpayer and then provide a service to encourage recycling. So there's a number of materials that we take. Uh, we take cardboard, paper, mixed paper, um, we also operate as a transfer station for, for trash. So you might have commercial contractors that are doing work on your home. If they bring that material into the RDF, they get charged, make a little bit of money on that in order to lower the overall cost of the operation for the taxpayers. Does that answer your question? 
Yes. Sure. The, the question is on the, the viability of recycling different types of plastics. And plastics are one of the trickiest items because plastics are made up of so many different polymers. When you look on the, on the recycling symbol, that you know, the one through seven symbols that are on plastics, they have, those are essentially different resin codes. And the probability of certain resin codes to get recycled is higher than others. One, there's a very high probability. Two, there's a very high probability. Threes are PVC, and so unless you're producing a lot of PVC, you're not going to get that recycled. It's recyclable if you can get a trailer full of it, but as a residential operation, we just don't produce that much PVC. So threes aren't really going to get recycled in our program. Fours are also recyclable, but they don't have a strong value in our program because they're not produced that extensively on a residential level. Fives, on the other hand, are pretty recyclable. And so most of our rigid plastics that we're collecting at the facility are number fives or number twos. So there's a high probability there. Back to sixes, not as much. Sevens is a catch-all and it's not worth anything to anyone. So when we're marketing plastics in particular, we really focus on ones and twos and fives and rigid plastics. The three through sevens, they're a throw in. Some of it will go to a secondary plastics processor who will go through it after and try to separate it out into the individual resins, but they don't have a lot of economic value in our system. One thing that I think is important to, to emphasize on, on plastics is if it doesn't have a recyclable symbol on it, please don't include it in the program. Uh, it, it, we spend our, the most amount of time uh, from, for our, from the staff perspective of cleaning up plastics than we do any other product. Um, unfortunately, there's also plastics that are potentially recyclable but don't ever get recycled. So for instance, black plastic. You'll see a number on it. You say, I'm doing the right thing. It's even got the right number, you know, one or two on it. But once it gets to a processor, because they use what are called optical sorters, which are essentially infrared sorters that look for different color grades, the black plastic looks the same as the belt that it's traveling on. And so something as simple as that turns a product that could be recycled into a product that won't be recycled. So we've been toying with the idea of just letting people know, exclude the black plastic, uh, because every time that I call a mill and I say, do you want a trailer full of black plastic? They say, well, take some pictures and send it to me. And I say, well, it's gonna take me a year to get a trailer full of black plastic, so I'm not really committing to that. Um, my question is not on the numbers, it's on that 20 minutes or more that I spent at the wall trying to figure out, is my bottle light brown or is it light green or is it <laughs> how to do the glass, how to do the plastic, do I take the little colored top off of the frosted milk, whatever, um, and, and maybe this is just a, a request is that for people who want to do the right thing, which is probably everybody here, can we get better instructions so that we have a better level of, you know, and does it really matter? I mean, is it, does it matter whether it's light brown or light green and which one I go into it? And can I actually recycle blue glass because I've been told I can't and, and things like that. But I think a lot of people are, get frustrated when they recycle, try to recycle in the end. You know, if they're, if they're saying it's contamination, are we, yeah, that's a great question. It's related to the, the specifics of recycling certain items and how do I recycle this particular item? Do I leave the cap on? Do I take the cap off? What is recyclable? What's not? And the reality is that it's changing all the time. And we don't want you to think too much about it. We want you to do your best. <laughs> if you've got questions, ask our staff, definitely. Um, Pay attention to the signage, and we need to improve the signage, but pay attention to the signage. Don't pay attention to what everyone else has done. <laughs> Don't look in the, in the container and say, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Look at the sign, because unfortunately, monkey see, monkey do, we see it all the time that you know, someone will throw a plastic bag in with the non-bottle plastic, and then everybody throws in a bag in the non-bottle plastic. Uh, 
with glass, I'd like to talk about that specifically. We're seeing an interesting dynamic right now in glass, in the Northeast in particular. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of glass in the Northeast is actually getting recycled right now. It's for two reasons. One, the material recovery facilities from the single stream operations, they don't like glass. They're going to continue to say, uh, if there's anything we can get rid of, let's get rid of glass, because it actually damages their equipment. It also contaminates the other products. It contaminates the paper, contaminates the cardboard, which is the most valuable material when you're talking about the economics of recycling. What also is happening right now is that there was a glass bottle plant in Milford that closed down. And that was the major outlet for all bottle glass in New England. With that, they, uh, our recyclers said, we're not taking glass anymore from municipal sources. They'll take it from the stores for the bottle bill because it's extre extremely clean, but as soon as they hear that you have municipal glass, they're not interested in it at all. So what we're doing, we're processing glass as an aggregate. That's one of the other uses for recycling glass. Recycling. It's, it's not recycling it into a new bottle, it's just putting it into a secondary use to be used as a drainage material, essentially. So instead of crushed stone, they'll put crushed glass. What we hope that is going to happen is that we're going to see a change in those markets and that we'll be able to recycle glass again. And there's two ways that you recycle glass. You turn it into a bottle or you turn it into fiberglass insulation. There's a, a plant that's opening up in New Jersey it's from a company called Pace, which is supposedly going to be the largest glass recycler in the world. That is scheduled to open sometime in the next six months to a year. So we're waiting on that. But that's all the way in Jersey. So we're going to have to ship our glass all the way down to Jersey. The other is that there's uh, fiberglass insulation recyclers that are in, in Montreal that are looking now that there's such a problem in the Northeast with recycling glass and saying, can they expand their market down here? So we're hoping that those two forces actually allow us to start recycling glass again instead of just processing it as an aggregate. So the separating by colors is really important when you talk about creating new bottles because you can't make a clear bottle out of a brown bottle. Uh, also, the, the green bottles and the brown bottles, you need those separated too in order to make those new green and amber bottles. So the blue bottles, no, they're not really recyclable. We can process those right now as an aggregate, so if you want to throw them in for uh, until we tell you different, they will be used as an aggregate, which is better than it going to the landfill. I mean, would it be possible on the website to have, for those ones that are interested, to have this information? Because I mean, I know it is available as you spend a lot of time, but you know, especially you're talking about the dynamics, and it seems that now you're no longer sorting tin and aluminum cans. And for those of us who have been, you know, building our head how valuable aluminum is, it's like, well, what's going on? You know, so it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, something that we don't understand. Yeah, so what, we, what we've seen with uh, tin and aluminum right now is that we've always asked residents to separate out to as fine a level as possible so that we can make economic decisions on our side. And because it's so hard to re-educate on how to do something that we don't want to say, this week let's do this, next week let's do that. Uh, so we've been making a decision and sort of piloting, if you will, uh, the combined tin and aluminum because we've been mixing it for a number of years now and marketing it that way. And then that goes to a secondary processor and they send it through eddy currents and magnets and they separate out the two. So they do, it does get recycled. Um, and one of the reasons that we simplified it that way and went with just all cans also is because we found out the majority of the cans that were being placed in those containers were actually refundable. And so we're picking through those cans now and, and bringing those to essentially a bottle recycler so that we get the redeemable value from those bottles so that we can generate more revenue. So we're trying to adjust based upon market conditions and what we see coming into the facility. Um, but to your point, yes, more education can be done. We're looking at that and trying to develop some tools. Uh, and, and I wish Bev was right here because she was working on it for us for this past week. So she could have answered some more of those. Phyllis? Okay. Um, just on that note, uh, Samuel Wellesley has a uh, Wellesley High School senior. We'll be doing a senior project. We have a Recyclopedia, which is about recycling, and she will be updating it. So stay tuned. You can you know, work with the RDF on Sustainable Wellesley. I feel things change a lot, but it'll be on the Sustainable Wellesley website. Thank you, Phyllis. Did everyone hear that? Okay. Yeah, Sustainable Wellesley uh, on, on your website, is it Phyllis? 
that they have a recyclopedia that's either done or in progress uh, with a high school senior that's been working on it to answer some of those questions and give some clarification on how to recycle in, in Wellesley's model. Is that correct? Only Wellesley. Only Wellesley. Great. Thanks so much. You mentioned bottle caps. Should we take them off? Take the bottle caps off. And when you compare to other programs, they're going to say keep the bottle caps on. <laughs> we, we keep them off in Wellesley because we're just looking for the actual resin type that's on, say, a milk bottle. And the cap is a different resin. In a single stream recycling facility, they want the cap on because it helps it keep its shape. And the material recovery facilities, their systems are designed to distinguish between a three-dimensional item and a two-dimensional item. So once that <coughs> bottle becomes flattened, it starts acting like paper. And so it goes into their paper stream as opposed to their plastic bottle stream. So that's why you're going to see them say, no, include the cap on because it helps them keep that shape. But the, but the milk carton, take the cap off. Take the caps off. And you'll see that there's little containers in front of there. We can put your caps in. Yes? Um, so I hear what you're saying about the markets are changing for the different things that we're separating out. But is it safe to say that at this point it's all going someplace, whether it's being recycled or maybe aggregate, or is any of it ending up in the landfill at this point? Uh, the question is, is any of the material coming into the RDF going to landfill? It is not. In the recycling side. It's all getting recycled. So there's contamination that does that people do put in, sort of the wish cycling and the, the plastic bags, and we're pulling those out, and that's going to landfill. But any of the signage that we have for the specific recycling that we're targeting it's getting recycled. And that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this is really one of the things that I think distinguishes Wellesley's program from uh, the single stream programs, is that the quality of the material that's coming through has enabled us, not only for National Sword, this latest, sort of what I hope is a blip in the road, um, but from other, uh, other downturns that we've seen in the past. So Wellesley's system, although it's laborious, uh, enables us to weather these storms. And so we might see dips in the value of recycling, but we haven't had a problem moving material for one. And when I say moving material, that means to send it to someone where it'll actually get recycled. And two, we've always been able to move it for a higher economic value than anybody around us. And so really the residents deserve a lot of credit there for doing a great job recycling, and our staff deserves a lot of credit for actually separating it out and, and cleaning it up. Yes? Um. Over the last few years, packaging has gotten much more complex. The mixed materials like with soup and juice containers and boxes with four or five layers of coffee cups that are resin coating. How does that affect the sorting and the um, recoverable materials? So the question is about changes in packaging and how we're moving from as an example, say glass to plastic and from, uh, from plastic to complex Tetra packaging with you know, four or five layers that's there, uh, that has a big effect. And I think the, one of the things that we're dealing with as, as a municipality is that we're always chasing. We're reacting to what packaging prod, uh, producers are, are making, to what's on the store shelves. And in order for something to be recyclable, not only does it have to have contents that's actually recyclable and someone on, on the other end to actually say, yes, I want that and to make that into something else, but there has to be enough of it to actually justify us creating an area at the RDF, collecting it, cleaning it up, make, getting a trailer full of it and sending it to somebody. So when we talk about like Tetra packaging, I mean, there's really great benefits to some of those materials. Um, they're lighter. So what the result of that is that there's less transportation costs. There's less fuel that's being used. Um, there's less greenhouse gas that's being emitted because of it. The downside is that it's producing packaging that's not re recyclable, um, at least not in the volumes that we see. So I've been doing a lot of research into cartons, for instance. That's one of the common questions that comes up about Wellesley's system is that you know, I can recycle cartons in that community, but when I come to Wellesley, I can't recycle cartons. And when I say cartons, I mean like uh, your milk cartons, uh, what are called gable top and also juice boxes that are aseptic packaging um, that are you know, foil lined and then a layer of plastic in on the inside of that as well as that's what happens with the milk cartons. And I finally found somebody who will recycle them. The problem is, is we just don't generate that much of it. And so 
cartons represent about one to two percent of the recycling stream. And for us, that would be approximately 70 tons a year. And that sounds like a fair amount. And that's roughly anywhere from one to three trailerfuls a year. And we'd probably make about $7,000 from that. So we'd devote an area at the RDF, do all the work, and make $7,000 gross revenue, not, a, not the cost of it. And so we, we always have to look at the materials that we're collecting at the facility and say, what makes economic sense? What makes environmental sense? Where we can, where we can get the most value for our effort? So it's a tough one. Tetra packs are right there as well. And I think one thing that I want to highlight is that we really have a, a disconnect in our system where producers of packaging aren't, responsibility, aren't responsible for the packaging. They're responsible for getting it on the shelves and having it sell. Put some attractive labeling on it so that a consumer will buy it. I'd love to see everything in a brown cardboard box. <laughs> you know, no ink, <laughs> just, <laughs> just a brown box, simple, but that's not what people are buying, unfortunately. And again, the producers of the packaging don't have responsibility for the packaging. And I think there's a real disconnect there. Yes? I prefer that you didn't. Okay, thank you. I'll tell you. <laughs> that, that, that was on flattening the plastic bottles and plastic and uh, tin cans. The, the refundable. Yeah. Yes, please, no, do. please don't. And um, washing. How much? How many? Yeah. How much resources should we use in cleaning items? Uh, the question is about washing, recycling. It's very important. So food <coughs> is a contaminant to all recycling. It's going to get washed somewhere along the process. And it's most efficient if you do it at home. It, cr it creates essentially problems for us at the facility because now we essentially have rotting food in the facility. So the amount of resource that you, that you devote to it, I think you, it behooves to be mindful of that. If I had to make a s strong argument, I'd say on a glass peanut butter gl jar, throw it away from a resource conservation standpoint because it's gonna take a lot of resources to actually wash that. You could get a little bit of finer with that where you could say, well, we don't have a water problem in the Northeast, but if I was in the Southwest, well, we do have a water problem, maybe I wanna change my decision making there. Uh, so I can't give you the, the perfect answer there, but please rinse out anything that you can. Washing is really important for recycling. Again, resources are gonna be spent somewhere along the line to either take it out and throw it away or to, or to wash it in order to be recycled. My last question is um, this explosion of online ordering and just every day like, all these brown paper boxes. Is that any good for recycling? I mean, what does that use to make those? It's boxes? good for the economic. So the question is on sort of the Amazon phenomena and online ordering and the impact of, say, cardboard on recycling. It's great economically, but we're using a lot more packaging, I think. Um, certainly a lot more transportation instead of just going to one store and buying what you need. Now, now I get, you know, I, I make an order from Amazon for two items and I get them in two separate packages and with, that are oversized and just a lot of, you know, uh, plastic air bubbles that are in them uh, as opposed to just going to a store and buying it myself. So I'd, I don't know if there's been studies on it per se. We, we're definitely seeing an increase in cardboard, and which is great from the revenue numbers that we say that we're generating and from the amount of tonnage that we're uh, recycling. But we have a we've sort of a catch-22, where we measure our success in recycling by tonnage. But just because we're recycling more doesn't mean we're doing better for the environment. It just means that we're generating more waste and recycling. So I'd love to see, on, on a certain respect, our recycling numbers go down and our revenue go down, because that means that we're actually producing less waste. Yes? Since you mentioned the plastic bubble stuff, all these packages that come in there, uh, what are we supposed to do with that? So those plastic bubbles are part of a category that's called film. And film is essentially any stretchable plastic. 
So that could be uh, your dry cleaning bag, that could be your uh, produce bag from the store, that could be your, your plastic bag that you don't get in Wellesley but you get in Natick. Um, or not even in Natick, I could be wrong there. Framingham. Framingham, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, Natick. Um, and so that's all part of a category called plastic film. And the most successful programs that I've seen for plastic film are actually at the supermarkets. So I believe Whole Foods and Wellesley accepts plastic bags and plastic film. The real thing to make sure that you do there is not include any food material and that they're dry. Because essentially what they do with that material is that they collect it, it goes back to their distribution center, gets sent down south, and that gets made into uh, composite lumber. Uh, Trex is a, a, a company that's out there that takes those bags and uh, a lot of it will get moved into that stream. And so th those are, that's the most successful program that I've seen. Um, does it matter if it's dark, dark plastic? Does it matter if it's dark plastic? I think they prefer just the clear. That's my understanding. I'd have to do a little bit more research there. What's it? Oh, that was oh, oh, sorry, Lisa. They take white? Take white bags. How about the uh, amber or the brown bags? I, I think they prefer not to take the brown ones. Definitely. Yeah, I think essentially once you start to get into the colors, then that affects what colors that they can make. Okay. So, um, so, getting back to the black boxes that you said are recyclable, like, so the, is that essentially the takeout containers that a lot of this? Okay. So, is there a way to sort of educate the businesses about that? I'm, I'm trying to do that at Lost Club because they're very egregious about like, you, know, you get 10 takeout containers with your meal, and they're all black plastic. So I bring my own if I have takeout with it. Just wondering if there's a way to educate other vendors around town, because some of them probably don't know that you know they're not being recycled. Or it, they might not care, but if they do care, then they can let uh, yeah, the, the question was, is there anything we can do to educate the businesses uh, that the black plastic isn't getting recycled? Um, yes, so let's work on that. <laughs> Sorry, one other question. Sorry. Um, so the pizza boxes, this is like an age-old question. <laughs> Those are, you, I, my understanding is you're not supposed to recycle the pizza boxes that are greasy? Food is bad. A little bit of grease is fine. Okay. <laughs> some of the pizza places in town, I've noticed, do put like a, la a thicker layer to, I think, maybe, uh, you know, solve that problem. But that's another issue. So the wax or parchment type of yeah, paper? Yeah, it's, it's a thicker one so it doesn't, you know, go through it. Yep, throw that away, put your pizza box in the recycling. Right. So I'm just wondering, again, if there's like, you know, there's, as we Education. know, many pizza places around town to just, you know, educate them about, like, use a thicker layer so that we can recycle all your pizza boxes. I, th I think that's a great suggestion. You know, one thing that we do with the RDF is that we send notifications out to the businesses each year that we exist and try to use us as a resource. And so maybe included in, in that, we can have some additional guidance or some resources for them to, to look at. So let's work together on that. Hi. Hi. Can you uh, recycle the shipping envelope to have a brown paper outer and a bubble pack uh, liner? Uh, the question is about uh, the shipping packages that have the yellow or brown outside and the bubble wrap on the inside. And the answer is, unless you can separate the bubble wrap out from the paper, no. Reuse it. Reuse it if you can. Throw it away. Maybe create some good insulation out of it or something. Yes. As a separate, so the question is, if I correct me if I'm wrong, uh, why can't single stream communities just start separating out paper on its own so that it encourages the recycling of that? And it's called dual stream recycling, and some communities do that already. I believe Lexington is one community that is dual stream. Um, essentially, what that entails is another recycling route. So there's pros and cons of those systems. Uh, the pros is that you're actually separating out high quality paper 
and it's getting recycled in that stream and it ha has more value. The downside is that you're sending another trash truck around town to pick it up. So there's costs associated with that. I believe that Natick does have a transfer station though, which might be an outlet for you if you want to actually just bring your paper there. You would have to take it there. You would have to take it there. You would have Single to. Single stream is so effective as far as getting people to participate. It's extremely effective. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we see such a a boon in single stream over these past you know, decades. And it's one of the reasons that uh, states continue to push it because it is successful in capturing more material. And just the downside is that it's also capturing a lot of contamination. So that's why the education component of it is so important. <coughs> Uh, the question is about fabrics and textiles and ripped up socks. <laughs> and um, please give us it all. Uh, Goodwill and the other companies that take textiles want all of that fabric. There's a number of things that they do. It's a common uh, concern that if it's not good enough for me, why would I think that it's good enough for somebody else? But in reality, they do a number of things with textiles. They'll take the textiles, textiles that are worth something and they'll sell them in their stores to help with their their missions. Um, they'll take the, the ones that aren't good enough to sell the stores and they'll send them to third world countries and help clothe people. The ones that aren't good enough to, to do that, they'll start to make into rags. So we say, give it all to us. Don't give us things that are dirty. And by dirty, I mean like with mud on it. If it's stained, that's fine. If it's ripped, it's fine. If you've got one shoe, that's fine. If it's a backpack that's torn, that's fine. Give it all to us, we'll handle it. We'll let them go through it. The same way that we say, give us your recycling and we'll clean it up, um, give us your textiles too. Textiles are actually, 85% of textiles in the United States that can be recycled are thrown away. There's a major impact that we can make with actually recycling our textiles. So whether it's at the RDF or it's at clothing bins that you see around town or other towns, utilize them. It's actually, there's a pretty robust market there and a great opportunity to take items and divert them from the landfill. Sure, yeah, we'll take one more question. Will. One of, one of the uh, disturbing sites that I see at the dump is when you take your trash and dump it into the, into the dumpsters. This, and this is garbage. The dumpster is filled with white plastic bags that were normally people, you know, throw their trash in the white plastic bag. What happens to those bags? So to make sure that I understand your question well, so in the regular trash containers, the yes. compactors? Yes, yes, right, right. People's household garbage bags, right. like a, a kitchen garbage bag, right. white colored. Right being thrown in, yes. and is there anything that we can do about those yeah. white garbage the bags? are usually loaded with, yeah. with those white bags. Well, one thing that could be done, which, so essentially what's gonna happen is that those bags full of trash are gonna go into a landfill. They're going to get covered and never break down. Um, I suppose there's probably something that could be done in terms of creating a biodegradable bag that's made out of plastic. Um, there's a difference between compostable bags and biodegradable bags. Uh, bio, compostable bags will actually are made out of plant starches and will break down and are fine to go on land. Biodegradable bags have microorganisms that I, I believe are embedded in, with the polymers that will help it break down, but it still leaves microplastics. Um, so nothing good comes of it, but maybe it would potentially break up enough to allowed the rest of the materials that are in there to break down a little bit. But I don't know of a, a really great solution there other than if you come to the compactors, empty the contents of your bag and go reuse it. That's a possibility. Some, somehow there's enough of that that would seem to me that it's worth addressing on a systemic basis. Thanks, Will. We'll look into that. Definitely, Will. That's a good point. Maybe one last from Lisa. I just want to say about that, oh. it's a great, actually it's a great reason to do the food waste program because mm -hmm. if you're doing the food waste program and you're not putting your food in your trash, you don't need those plastic bags because you can just use a paper bag. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because those, you know, the trash isn't all gooey and liquidy. And I, I, that's what I've done myself and I've heard from other people who are in the food waste program who 
say the same thing, that they, they're not buying the plastic bags anymore because their trash is dry. Mm -hmm. So it's a good point for the food waste company. That's a great point, Lisa. Uh, in case you didn't hear, Lisa was mentioning that it's a great reason to participate in the food waste program because it makes your trash cleaner, uh, eliminate the need, the need to have the plastic bags to keep liquids and wet materials in, and that you can just use, say, a paper bag, which will have an easier time breaking down. Uh, so it's a way of sort of cleaning up your trash by isolating your food waste and participating in that program. And I think Anne's here to save me. Thank you very much. Oh, not, sorry. Thank all of you for coming this evening.